Hello and good morning to everyone everywhere. Welcome to the 11 a.m. Sunday Assembly at the Orange Vale Church of Christ. My name is Chuck Polis and I want to let you know that in addition to our online assembly that's happening right now, that we also have an in-person, indoor assembly that happens at 9 a.m. on Sundays. And so if you're in the neighborhood next Sunday, we pray that you'll join us. Later on today at 6, we have a Zoom adult Bible study that is looking at the prison epistles. And tonight, we're working on Colossians chapter 4. And then on Wednesday nights, our Zoom adult Bible class at 7 is looking at a series of lessons that we're calling Foundations for Disciples. And this Wednesday, our topic is on family. We also have a Zoom children's class that happens at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesdays, and that's a class for children between the ages of 8 and 12 years old. Plus, we also offer a more comprehensive, work-at-your-own-pace kind of Bible study with a real-life Bible study helper, and you can sign up for that by visiting our website at ovchurch.org and clicking on the banner for World Bible School. And if you want more information on any of those classes, even tech support on how to get connected with Zoom, please message us through Facebook, YouTube, or you can even email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org so that we can get you the Zoom ID and the class materials that you need and get you connected. Jim has another print ministry update to share with us today. He reports that we have just shipped a pallet of 13 boxes of English and nine boxes of Chiwa World Bible School Lesson Books to Malawi Project. The English will be most useful in the North, while the Chiwa, Chiwa will be most useful in the South. So we want to pray for the success of the print ministry and the material being used over there in uh, Malawi. New to the prayer list this week, we want to remember all of those who are having to deal with the severe weather or cost across the country, with the frigid temperatures and the damage that has caused in many parts of our, of our nation that have never experienced those temperatures in decades. So let's keep those families in our prayers. As always, if you have any announcements for next week's bulletin or prayer requests to please let us know. Shall we pray? Most Holy Father, dear God in heaven, again, we do so want to thank you for blessing us with this day. Father, we thank you for giving us another opportunity to come before you and to sing songs of praise to you and hear a message from your word. And Father, we pray that as you look upon this earth, that you would look upon it with kindness and bless us all as we're struggling with so many different things, with COVID-19, with frigid temperatures, and with things that are just making life sometimes difficult. That, you pray, that we pray that you will bless us with a spirit of calm and peace. Father, we ask that you be with all those uh, struggling around uh, our country and around the world. Father, help us all to walk closer to you and lead others to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Deuteronomy. I will read from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 from the International Version. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on door frames of your houses and on your gates. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. 
Send us love, send us power, send us grace. King of my life, I crown thee now, I shall glory thee. Lest I forget thy thorn crown, crown, lead me to Calvary. It's at this time that we would like to invite you to share the Lord's Supper with us wherever you may be. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes to the Christians there to remind them just what the Lord's Supper is really all about. And so starting in verse 23, he tells them that I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's take this time to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us in the bread and the cup. Let's pray. Most Holy Father, dear God, again, we want to thank you so much for this weekly reminder of your son's sacrifice that you've commanded for us to do. And Father, as we partake of this bread, Father, help us to remember Jesus and all that he has done for us. In his name that we pray. Let's continue in prayer. Father, dear Father, thank you, Father, for your son's sacrifice, for his blood shed on the cross, the blood that gives us the forgiveness of sins. And Father, as we reflect upon your son's sacrifice for, for our souls, Father, we come before you in thanksgiving, thanking you for blessing us with all the spiritual blessings that we have through your son, Jesus. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. And that concludes the Lord's Supper, and it's at this time, out of a matter of convenience, that we take up the offering. Again, I want to thank all those who have either brought by or mailed in their support for the church here in Orangevale. May God continue to bless you as you have blessed others. If you did happen to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and read that passage earlier about the Lord's Supper, I'd like to encourage you to flip on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and read verses 1 and 2 with me. 
There Paul writes, now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Now here in these few verses, we see that it is the practice of the church to take up the collection on the first day of every week, on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. That's because that's when we're supposed to meet, right? And that every Christian is to set aside a sum of money based upon their income for the offering. And so whether you're here in person or if you could help support the ministry, you're sitting at home and think, hey, I could help things out or or maybe um, uh, you're online or whatever you're doing. Um, if you could help in any way, I'd like to encourage you to do so as a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Father, dear God, again, we wanna thank you for blessing us with everything that we have. And Father, as we give our offering unto you, we pray, Father, for the spread of your kingdom here locally and around the world. We thank you for blessing us in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, you are welcome to bring your offering by during your next visit, maybe next Sunday at 9 a.m. and you're in the neighborhood, or if you can't make it, you do attend services online. We want to encourage you to mail in your support or, or use your bank's bill pay or whatever method you feel is appropriate with the resources you have. You could, again, mail us a check, and you would send that to 5915 Main Avenue, Orangevale, California, 95662. It's at this time that we would like to encourage you to sing along as we play the next hymn before the message today. Holy hands, touch us with your tender touch. Remove the web of fear, the clouds are silent things above. And let us not forget the reason that your Son was crucified. For you wanted us back home so that you dared to let him die. We are children of the heavens. Changes in this world because we know we're heaven bound. Though darkness tried to hide it, you made sure the truth was known. We're children of the heavens and you're calling us back home. Holy arms, keep us locked in your embrace. Protect us from the wickedness that hates your saving grace. And let us keep our eyes on Jesus and tell others there's a way to return with him to heaven when he comes the final day. We are children of the heavens. Strangers in this world because we know we're heaven bound. Though darkness tried to hide it, you made sure the truth, the truth was known. We're children of the heavens and you're calling us back home. We will one day sing with angels as we stand before the throne. Singing glory, hallelujah, our Father has called his children home. We are children of the heavens, once lost but now we're found. We're strangers in this world because we know we're heaven bound. Though darkness tries to hide it, you made sure the truth was true. We're children of the heavens and you're calling us back home. 
Hello again. Well, you know, last week we talked about walking with our spouse. And for most couples, a natural result of walking with your spouse is children. And so today we're going to continue our Walking Through Ephesians sermon series with a message we're calling Walking With Your Children. And to start things off, I'd like to read a passage from the book of Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 1 through 9. There Moses writes, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey it, that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, think about when this passage was written and to whom it was written to. The Israelites were just about to cross the Jordan River and enter the Promised Land, a land said to be flowing with milk and honey, but it was also a land filled with many strange and dangerous people and ideas. And so it was more important than ever to remind the people that they needed to not only remember God's Word and His commands, but to live them out in their everyday lives. And that meant that if the nation was going to continue, then the parents of Israel's legacy needed to instill God's word in their children. And they were to do this not only by sharing God's teachings, but by living out God's teachings every day and in every way as examples for their children to follow, to talk about God's Word when you sit at home or when you walk along the road or when you lie down or when you get up. And so let's go ahead and talk about Christian parents and their children being able to walk along together by taking a look at God's design for parents and their children in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4. Okay, so let's first talk about how the child is to walk along with their parents. And we'll do that by reading Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. There we're told that children are to obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And if you are familiar with the book of Colossians, there's a passage that's almost identical to this in Colossians chapter 3. And there in verse 20, we're told that children are to obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Now, I know that we only have a few young people within our congregation here at Orangevale. But we can still pass this teaching on to our children so that it can help them out with our grandchildren, right? And possibly even our great-grandchildren and generations to come. Just think about the world that we live in and what they're teaching the children now. You know, the truth is it doesn't matter what the schools or the media or anyone else says. If any young person wants to be a Christian, then they need to do what God says, period. And if they choose to ignore God, then they're choosing to sin, to not live like a Christian. 
But again, the truth is only that God can save them from the judgment and hell. All the schools, their peers, and the media can't do that. But again, it's a choice that everyone has to make in their life. Okay, so thinking about children having to obey their parents. You know, one of the big issues are, are the rights of children. Don't children have any rights in this whole obey your parents thing? Well, sure, children have rights, but they also have responsibilities, like the responsibility to obey their parents. Okay, well, let's break that down a little bit from our text. Notice that there are two qualifiers to the command for children to obey in the Lord. And the first is that the command is given to children. In other words, while children are living under their parents' roof and they're supported by their parents, they are commanded to obey. But eventually, like Jesus teaches in Matthew 19, 5, a time will come when a person will leave their father and mother, will go out on their own, you know? And it's at that time, when they're out on their own, that the obligation to obey no longer applies. That's because, you know, they're not under their parents' authority. They're not under their roof. They're still obliged to honor, though. But as long as they're living with their parents, well, hey, they're under their authority. And that means they're to obey. Okay. The second qualifier is the fact that the command given by the parents, the commands given by the parents are in the Lord, right? The command to obey given by the parents is in the Lord. In other words, children are obligated to obey their parents as long as that obedience will not cause the child to violate the teachings of God. And so if a parent tells their child to lie, cheat, or steal, then that child has the biblical right to resist and say no or, or not do it, you know? And so the way that the child is to walk is to walk in obedience. Of course, again, as the child grows into adulthood and, and moves out on their own, they're no longer obligated to obey their parents, but again, they're still commanded to honor their parents. And that honor is shown in things like appreciation, respect, and care. Again, the way that the child is to walk is in obedience. But what about how the parent is supposed to walk? Well, that's a fair enough question, right? Because we're walking along together. Well, the answer again is found in our main text. Let's go ahead and read Ephesians 6 and verses 1 through 4 all together. There we're told that children are to obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, you might be thinking you've got something good to say, right, Chuck, about all this? And, you know, I, I think I do, but I'll be honest, I, I don't exactly like what I'm going to say. And that's because I'm a parent and I know what it's like to have disobedient children. And I struggle with things just like every other parent. But one of the reasons that our children are disobedient is because their parents have failed to fulfill their God-given responsibility in the parent-child relationship. And I don't mean that I'm pointing fingers at anybody because you know the story, right? When you point a finger at somebody else, you got three more pointing back at you. So I have my own, you know, failures I have to deal with in this whole thing. But remember last week how we talked about how a Christian wife is commanded to submit to her Christian husband. We talked about how some people would think that's just not, you know, a, a right thing to do, you know, especially with the way the world thinks today. Well, we saw that the reason why a Christian wife can do that without question is because her Christian husband loves her just like Jesus loves the church. At least he's supposed to, right? And that makes it, you know, possible. 
for her to submit to him because he loves her so much. Well, our children will also find it easier to obey their parents when their parents have fulfilled their God-given responsibilities to them. And the first parental responsibility is to be a Christian. And I know that sounds like a given, but there are a lot of parents, they're not Christians. They don't, they don't want to even acknowledge God, okay? Sadly, there are also some parents out there who are Christian, but a name only. And so a Christian parent is one who is going to follow God's word, right? Follow God's word in all things and are going to show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and uh, self-control. Those are all the fruits of the Spirit, right? They're going to show those things in their life to their children as examples to their children. They're also going to teach and rebuke and correct and train in righteousness with God's Word, just like God's Word tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Again, parents are to be Christian parents. The second parental responsibility is back in the first part of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, where we're told that fathers, and for our purposes and our discussion, we're going to say parents, okay, are not to exasperate your children. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means, you know, to excite or to inflame with anger, you know, to, to cause irritation or annoyance. And so practically, we're talking about parents not being harsh and unforgiving or unfair or mean-spirited. We're talking about parents not ignoring or shaming or ridiculing or being manipulative. Think about it, you know, when a parent does those kinds of things, then they're exasperating their children. And that's not helping them. It's only pushing them to the edge, or to the breaking point, to giving up, and sometimes, sadly, on life. And so, if a parent is not to do any of that, then what's a parent to do? Well, the rest of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 tells us to instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And like we said a few minutes ago, that, that involves teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. To teach them the facts about the Lord from His Word. Facts like how God is holy and just and all-powerful and all-knowing and all-present. About how, how much God loves them and, and what God expects from them to, to love and to serve with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength to love their neighbor as their self. And while Christian parents are to teach their children these truths and so much more, you remember again back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 6 and 7, we're told that these commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, and everything you do, right? And so the truths that the Christian parents teach their children aren't really just supposed to be facts. You need the facts, though. But they're supposed to be truths that are practically lived out and shared by the parents' example. Okay. So, parents are to walk with their children, not by exasperating them, but with the training and instruction of the Lord. So what does that look like? What does it look like for a parent and a child to walk together in the Lord? For a parent to train their child in the Lord? Well, first, we train our children by demonstrating that God is first in our lives. And we do that by not only telling them how important church and God is, but by showing it in our lives. And that can be done by regularly assembling with the church, whether it's in person or if you can't, online, you know? 
And it can also be done by showing the love of God to those around us through kind and loving words and actions. We also train our children by disciplining them with love and authority. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, in some homes, it can be hard to tell who's in charge. But the truth is, God has placed the parents in the position of authority in the home, with the husband as the head of the home. So parents need to take that position of authority with love and discipline. Think about it. You know, it's usually the child who doesn't learn to obey their parents that are likely to grow up and not obey any kind of authority. So what about this? Well, I, I remember coming across a meme not too long ago that said discipline begins in the playpen, not in the state pen. The point being that there is a general lack of, res of, of, of there's a general lack of discipline and respect for authority among the youth of our nation. And that's why it's ever so important to teach our children the right way, God's way, in our homes so they can be a light in the darkness rather than be a part of the darkness. Third, we train our children by teaching them the principle of sowing and reaping. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 tells us to not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The point being that we need to allow our children to suffer the consequences of their own mistakes. You know, we can't helicopter them and protect them from everything and bail them out from every mistake they've ever made. They need to experience the pain and the discomfort themselves with the wrong actions they've made. And that's so that they'll learn what not to do and that there are consequences for doing bad things. At the same time, we need to encourage them to work and to earn things for themselves, to find joy and reward in accomplishing things for themselves. And that's so that they can one day become self-sufficient and take care of themselves and to be a blessing to others rather than a burden. Just one more for today. And that is, that we train our children by discipleship. In other words, by being the mentor, by being the guide, by being the counselor that they need in order to succeed in life. Just think about Jesus and his disciples. He just didn't say, yeah, go read the Torah and get back to me later. No, right? Yeah, sure, Jesus was their master and Lord, but he walked with them, right? Training and advising them together, guiding and leading them, instructing and counseling them, answering all of their questions, you know? And that is exactly what a Christian parent needs to do to walk with their children, to disciple them, to train them in the way that they should go so that they will not depart from it. Again, walking with your children means that children need to obey their parents in the Lord while they're young and to honor their parents always, especially when they're older. And it means that parents are to not exasperate their children, but to train and instruct them in the ways of the Lord, just like the Lord. With the commandments of God on your hearts, impressing them on your children, ah, as you talk, as you talk about things at home or as you're driving in the car or walking in the mall, just everywhere you go with them. Of course, in order for parents to be able to walk with their children the way that God intended, it's important for the parents to be Christians. And if you're not a Christian, you can be simply by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of a living God, 
and upon your trust in him to turn to him in repentance, confessing him as Lord and Savior, and then commit yourself to him by being immersed in the watery grave for the forgiveness of your sins. And then rising up out of the water, well, you're born again, right? So as a born again soul, you're, you're a Christian, and now you continue to live your life for the Lord until he comes back again where you go to be with him. For those of us who are already Christians, well, it's my hope and prayer that we can all walk with our children and the Lord, both now and in eternity. Again, if anyone has the need to share or to seek prayer or to become a Christian for the very first time, I would like to encourage you to message us through Facebook or YouTube, or you can email me directly at minister at obchurch.org. Let's pray. Most Holy Father, dear God, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your instructions. We thank you for the examples that you've given us in your word, especially that of your son, Jesus. And Father, as a people discipling our children, Father, we pray that you'll help us to be good Christian parents and help us as children to be good, obedient children, honoring our parents always. Father, we thank you and pray that You'll help us to be good children of yours, honoring you and obeying you always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we want to thank you for making us part of your Lord's Day and pray that you'll worship with us the next time that we meet here in Orangevale, Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock here in our building. Of course, we do understand that that might not be an option for you because of health issues or maybe you're under some sort of quarantine because of COVID or or maybe you just choose to worship at home at this time. And so we hope that you'll assemble with us Sunday mornings at 11 right here on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you and God bless.